Okay, so I am going to try to present a framework for studying multimodal communication and social signal processing. And that this will then be in the form of a discussion of what social signal processing is. So let's start with the question why is social signal processing an interesting topic? And uh, I think for good and for bad, we are being and will be even more in the future artificially monitored by various devices. And I think social signal processing fits into this kind of paradigm. We're being, we're being monitored by artificial devices. For bad, we all know the uh, George Orwell scenery, Big Brother is watching you. So we are not going to be, you know, we, everybody knows what we're doing all the time. We're no longer allowed to have cash. We must always pay with plastic cards so the banks know where we are and can charge us extra money, etc., etc., etc. There will be increased control by companies. Uh, banks and so on, they have an excuse, they say they're controlling criminals, but they're controlling non-criminals as well. And uh, governments, big companies, lots of actors have interests in trying to surveil uh, surveillance. So that, those are the negative aspects of this. The positive aspects are that there are benevolent caretakers. They are, are caring and uh, trying to look out for you to look out for people who are sick, trying to help, help them if they need people to come and care for them. Aged people might need help if they are staying alone in their homes, etc., and they fall down and they cannot stand up. And young people, babies perhaps need help, and young people need help. Um, handicapped people, and we, in general we want different kinds of machines that we're using to be more adapted to personal needs of the user. So I, I think that there are, as nearly with all technological innovations, there are lots of pluses and lots of minuses, <laughs> and, and they are coming with this. But I think sometimes we should reflect on this and not just uh, construct more, because some of the things we do are going to be more prone to negative use than positive use. Are we always going to be able to tell the difference? No, we're not. But that's also part of the problem. And when we are asked to take, a tech, uh, to take an ethical stance on new technology, this is a problem. We don't really know. Let's you know, think of the problems that came up when nuclear energy was, was started. A similar kind of problems. Um, in any case, social processing is an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary enterprise. The difference between interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary, you get a lot of people together and you ask them to solve a problem. If you do that and you don't take care that they know anything about each other's disciplines, what you're going to find is that they misunderstand each other all the time. And they use terms in different ways, and they, uh, you know, I, I, in the social signaling framework, I've seen a lot of this, actually. <laughs> so social signaling, pro social signal processing has been multidisciplinary. I think it's becoming a little more interdisciplinary. The difference is that we begin to know a little about each other's scientific disciplines. When that happens, and when we know a lot, really a lot, then we can become yeah, more truly interdisciplinary. Okay, and what I hear are some of the um, disciplines I think that are, are relevant for social signal processing. Computer science, maybe they should be in the first place since Alessandro, if he is the starter, came from. <laughs> Actually, he's a physicist, but uh, he came from computer science. Uh, cognitive science, communication studies, psychology, linguistics, biology, sociology, anthropology. I'm probably missing something here, but I, to me, this, it seems that these are the most important. There's somebody in this room who feels left out. No, physics, acoustics, and, and uh, well, Yeah, they're basic for this. They, they, they are. Yeah, they, they are. Yeah, they are. I mean, that, we, we are we're working on top of physics, 
I, I agree. <coughs> but I don't know if physics, unless you, de you believe in things like the quantum theory of mind and so on, <laughs> which I sometimes do, <laughs> because I'm interested in it. If you don't believe in that sort of stuff, physics doesn't have a direct influence. It's more indirect that we have to be aware of the laws of physics and so on. You disagree? Yeah. Let's hear why. Evolution of language is based largely on the situation of the physics that we that we evolve in, and that, that's behind a lot of our behavior. I would, I would argue. Of course, that's what I'm saying. It's a background. It's not something that we're that we are foregrounding. Evolution of language is much closer to biology than it is to physics. Okay, biology is on this list. Okay. Now let's get to some definitions of social signal processing. So we have here social signal processing. So I tried my hand on this now and I thought social, let's define it simple, at least two humans, animals or agents. But that's a fairly simple definition. Signal, index, icon or symbols. Or if you like to go a slightly different route, which I will explain, indicators, displays, and signals in a narrow sense. For those of you who are not so familiar with semiotics, this is the Persian three-way division of ways in which we can carry information. So index is based on contiguity or causality. Uh, icon is based on similarity. And symbol is based on arbitrary convention. And according, if you believe this, which I do, then there are no other ways to carry information. That's it. So, so in, in this, I'm taking signal to be a, a fairly broad, undefined notion here, and it covers all three. The other alternative I'll come back to, indicator, display, and signal. Processing a sequence of operations on an input to produce an output or change of internal state, a series of actions, changes or functions bringing about a result. That's a fairly abstract definition, but I think it's okay. So, what we can, when we think about this, one of the things that I thought when I first heard social signal processing, I don't understand what it means, that's what I thought first, because I am, you know, I'm, like that all the time. I never <laughs> have to think for a while. <laughs> so, and then I realized why I didn't understand. Because it's sort of ambiguous. It's ambiguous between taking social as a process of the agents doing the processing. Then you have two people looking at the stars. In this sense, two people looking at the stars is social signal processing because they are there together looking at the stars. <laughs> Okay. The other sense, social is a pro property of the object that is being processed. That, I think, is the sense that is mostly intended, but I also notice that when people talk about this, they tend to slip a little, and sometimes they, they think about the other sense. Okay, so it's the object, pro mostly, what is intended. So a machine watching two persons' interaction is doing social signal processing. That's the object that's being processed. And you can, of course, imagine that both the agent and the object are social. That's a common case, which we will find sometimes in multimodal communication, which I'm going to get come back to. In that case, there's more focus on object than on agent. Now, since I'm also usually interested in history and etymology, I thought my definition of social was a bit short. You know, at least two people, humans or other agents. Um, let's see what etymology tells us. Well, it seems that in English, social entered around 1500. And you have here a characterization of the meaning, characterized by friendliness or geniality also allied, associated from Middle French social, from Latin socialis, united living with others, from socius, companion, probably originally follower, and related to sequi, to follow, which you find in sequence, and so on, 
and that's in turn related to an old Norse word, second, which means companion, which seems to have been formed on the same notion. All I notice here is that this history of the word is not incompatible with the short definition that I gave. It's compatible. So, if you just want a short notion of social, at least two people or other animals or other agents. Okay. Now, another thing that I like to do when I work on concepts is semantic role analysis. And uh, this goes under many names. Um, in Aristotle, it's called categories. In the French language, tenier, it's called uh, octons. And, uh, okay. But it's one very popular name of this has been semantic role analysis. What it means is that you take any action or yeah, any action, and you look at what arguments. If you speak more in a logical way, you'll talk about a predicate and its arguments. And these are the arguments of the predicate. So you'll ask, who does the action? In this case, social signal processing. So processing is the most important word here. That's the action. So who processes what? For what reason or purpose? With what instrument and resources? In what environment or context? In what manner or style? For how long? Giving what results? So if you want to put in Big Brother here, not Big Brother is watching you, so you can ask, what is, for what reason or purpose, with what instruments, secret camera up in the corner, or if you have a bank trying to look at the customers, trying to find out <coughs> which of the customers is trying to fool the bank, or I don't know what. But you can put in different actors here, or different arguments for this predicate processing, and, and you will get slightly different uh, notions. So you, you can, if you wanted to do an empirical investigation of so, how so, what kinds of social processing occur in the world today, this would be a schema you could use to generate questions. So you could go out and look at who is processing what? Uh, why are they doing that processing? For what purposes, etc. So it's very easy to use this as a kind of yeah, calc uh, that you just make questions from. And I, for many different research projects that I've had, I've used the similar calc. Yeah. You just generate questions quite quickly. This is, uh, for those of you who know a little about rhetoric, this is also the idea of topoi, or loci. Who knows anything about rhetoric here? You should. It's a basic social signaling processing <laughs> science. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so these questions are all relevant if you want to specify what type of social signal processing we are dealing with. And I just thought I'd make sure of give you an example here. So we have a computer who's the agent. He's processing emotions of that's the object. The reason, surveillance. And he's doing this with a face muscle recognizer. We'll hear more about those tomorrow. Um, and it's being done in a shop. And it's being done in a very approximate manner. So it's not very exact. And it's being done for 10 minutes. And it's being done in the evening, and it's being done in order to give more customer satisfaction. That's at least what is claimed. And so if you look at the customers, and you see if they look pleased, then you know you're on the right track and you'll sell more. Just wait, and this is going to be with us in 10 years. <laughs> okay, but you, I think you all see how this works. Yeah? Now, one of the things that I am particularly interested in is the relationship between social signal processing and multimodal communication. So the first thing I think we can note is that all multimodal communication can be an object of social signal processing. So anytime we have two people or two other animals communicating, if we try to understand what's going on, we have social signal processing. But 
So we can also take the case where we only have part of this process. So you have a human interacting with a computer. If we try to read the reactions automatically of the, of the human, that's also social signal processing. But if we have a human lying in his bed or her bed, communicating with no one, that's not social signal processing if we have a camera up in the corner trying to understand what the person is doing with, let's say, snoring in a particular way. <laughs> At least I would not think that is social signal processing because there's no, what's the sociality of that? It's a human being who's showing up some kind of behavior, perhaps tied with some inner states, etc. But I don't see why it's social. So it doesn't mean that anything human, analyzing anything human, is not, that's not going to be passing a social signal processing. There will be a limitation. Mm. Yeah? What about uh, if the person knows that someone is recording him? I think that then you are partly uh, communicating with the recorder, so I would think it's okay. It's a kind of weak social signal processing. Mm. <laughs> Then, I mean, you're aware, you're, you're actually, you're doing it for the record, so you are aware. But if you're not aware, and, you're, and there's no communicative purpose at all, communicative. Okay, I'll come to that. What if you have two people who are interacting, but they're, in, they're not really in any obvious sense communicating? They're not intending to influence each other, but they are influencing each other anyway. Is that, if we process what's going on, is that social signal processing? And is it multimodal communication? The answer is that it depends on your notion of communication. If you have a wide notion of communication, which includes non-aware and non-intentional influence and being influenced, then it is multimodal communication and also social signal processing. I have a wide notion of communication, so for me it would be. That, that, okay. If I want a more narrow notion, I will add adjectives. So I'll say intentional communication, aware communication, etc., etc. So you would, in the same way you could have intention, social, intentional social signals, aware social signals, and you could process them. So I don't see any reason for why we should exclude uh, behavior and influence which is not aware and not intentional. I think it should be included. And if you do include it, then as far as I can see, this means that social signal processing actually is in a broad sense concerned with exactly the same things, exactly the same things, as we are in multiple communication. That doesn't make you happy outside, I think. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So let us go now to multimodal communication and uh, see if we can well look at some of the phenomena which occur in multimodal communication and talk about them as challenges for social signal processing. And, uh, okay, so here we have a definition of multimodal communication. Co-activation, sharing and co-construction of information simultaneously and sequentially through several modes of perception and production occurring on several levels of intentionality and awareness. So lot, there are a lot of abstract words here. The idea, well, I talked already about the, the last part here. Several levels of intentionality and awareness. So we're not, we don't want to exclude the, the case when we have non-intentional and non-aware. Several modes of perception and production, that means uh, it's multimodal. You, you have vision, you have hearing, you have maybe touch, smell, taste, etc. <coughs> Co-activation means that I think basically communication always involves joint activation or something. Co-activation has the advantage that it doesn't really imply, it doesn't imply necessarily that what is being co-activated is aware and intentional. Sharing doesn't imply that either, but it has a little more of that sense. The whole definition is in contrast to the Shannon and Weaver approach, 
where you have transference of information from a sender to a receiver, which is a sort of telephone communication definition. Where the, the problem with that definition is that the receiver is far too passive. You, in real communication, the receiver is active all the time and showing by various signs how he or she reacts to whatever is being shared. So we want some definition which make sender and receiver much more equal. We don't want another uh, place where you can see this kind of telephone transmission definitions is actually when you look at the people who talk about turn-taking, conversational, ana conversational analysis. The whole idea of turn-taking makes most sense on the telephone. Doesn't really make sense if you stand and talk to somebody. You, then you have a simultaneous flow of information in both directions. This definition is supposed to capture that. So is, we, well, yeah. Isn't there a way to, to uh, sort of change or, or rather apply the Shannon and Weaver information in a, in a way that also would capture that of, of simultaneous information exchange and cutting it up and uh, allowing for a very fast and rapid exchange in that sense that would still function to allow feedback and things like that? Isn't there a way? That's the kind of question about possibility. Mm. I would not be able to say if there is a way or not. I haven't found it. Okay. Maybe you'll find it. <laughs> I just... Yeah. yeah? Isn't turn-taking very important in face-to-face -face, uh, uh, communication as well? It's just that you have much more um, importance than in the phone conversation and what's also simultaneously happening in the simultaneous communication. Turn so means that, the, that there is a main speaker. Or, or no, it, the person who holds the floor. Problem is, well, I'm looking but, at your face as sense. I'm talking, and you're talking simultaneously with me, or you're not talking simultaneously, but you're at least doing things with your face. But I'm avoiding talking at the same time. Well, maybe so, but you're doing things with your face, which oh, might be equally important. I agree. But there's these two levels to consider that. So on the no, one level, I'm good. stopping and listening every time you're talking, and then you know waiting for the cue that it's you know that you're going to start talking, and generally I, I shut up. So in the model we have, which I'm still going to show you, the model we have that I'm still going to show you, we have a main communicator. We call it instead of whatever what we call it main communicator. But that's in order to stress the fact that the others are also communicating at the same time. Okay, so we have this simultaneous flow of information, and I'm not denying the fact that at least sometimes we don't talk at the same time. <laughs> so it's sort of yeah, there is a kind of kind of turn taking, but not as strong as the sense that you get in CA in conversational analysis. But they are the I think that's the probably model. right. And I think the reason that this CA model has been so popular with computer scientists and so on is the fact that it is so similar to telephone talk and the kind of telephone processing definitions that you find in Shannon and Weaver. And, I, and it's much more complicated if you start to actually seriously consider the fact that information is flowing in both directions. So at the same time as you're a speaker, you're also a listener. Same time as you're a listener, you're also a speaker. And that's going on all the time. Okay, this definition is supposed to allow that. Right? So here is a little model that we use. A and B are communicating. The idea is that while they're communicating, there are influences going on as, on several levels at the same time. So this is the most unaware, the most unintentional, usually also the quickest, uh, unpremeditated, etc. This is the most aware, the most intentional, and usually also the slowest. And uh, there are many adjectives as, that you can use. What, the difference between this model, which has three levels, and Kahneman's um, model, which he published, was it last year? Who read this book by Kahneman? That was, it was a lot discussed. You haven't heard about this? It just has yes. two systems. 
But the two systems are like Freud. So, you know, it's like, no, Freud has three goals. <laughs> yeah, he has the super ego. So. Okay, but in many models, there are just two conscious and subconscious, or conscious and non conscious, or something. In Kahneman also has, he, I think he goes on system one, one two, and system two. two. Yeah, right. Right. And it was published last year, but it last has, year. I published papers on it yeah. for a long time. Right. So, anyway, it's been popular with many psychologists to think that you only have two. But here we have three. Uh, the reason for that is that we have these words here, indicate, display, and signal. And I said I was going to come back to those. So that, that's an analysis of levels of intentionality in communication. So if you don't intend to communicate anything, you're just doing things, but another person sees you and finds what you're doing informative and draws conclusions about you on the basis of what you're doing, that's indicating. Okay, so maybe, I don't know what I'm indicating today, maybe I'm indicating that I like the color red by the way. <laughs> but I haven't intended to communicate that to you, I just like the color red for my shirt. And maybe you drew that conclusion or something like that, I don't know if you did or not. But that would be indicated, okay. If I'm wearing this color shirt in order to show you that I like red, then I'm displaying and I'm displaying my fondness of the color red. But if I'm also wanting you to realize that I am showing you that I like red, then I'm signaling in this narrow sense. This is a different sense from the sense the word signal is used in social signal processing. Here it's a very specialized thing. Yeah? yeah. Are you fine with your burn red just because you would like to get attention? From the people, you know, like the color, sign, like yeah. that, usually. Then I'm displaying. Display. Display. If I want you to realize that I want to get intention, attention, then I'm signaling. Hmm. Okay, so that's stepping up. So it's, that, if it will be something right in your way to show like. Sorry? Look at me. If it will be something right in your to show like, for example, in your to yeah. 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 <laughs> then I would be... Depends on, I could be either displaying or signaling. It depends if I want you to realize that I'm showing you something or not. If I'm just wearing a shirt because it happened to be a shirt I bought and I not even saw the text myself, you know, I might even be indicating what's, what's being written. It, 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 this has to do with what level of engagement I have myself with my own behavior in relation to the other person. This, this is what I, I usually call communicative intentionality. Yeah? So would you say that people are, uh, I, I really like this model by the way, so this isn't a criticism, but would you say that people are more, uh, that are more aware of what they're doing, maybe students of communication for example, are by necessity displaying more often, because, simply because they are more aware? It's difficult to indicate if you know everything. <laughs> Take me, I am such a person. Sometimes I switch on that level, and I think I therefore display more. I am aware. But, okay, but there's a difference between, okay, I haven't gone into all the details here. There's a difference between myself being aware of what I'm doing and wanting you to be aware of what I'm doing, okay? So that's another, on the fine details of this, we get into that difference also. You could still be indicating even though you are theoretically aware of what it is you're doing. I could, then I would be aware of what I was indicating. Mm. Right, so... That, what this shows is that in a finer analysis, and I have a paper where I do this, you have to tease apart intentionality and awareness. Right. They, are, they don't always accompany each other. I'm doing it a little more uh, yeah, coarse now than it could be done. But that's right. They, they, and there are other dimensions as well, Jens, like speed. And I, actually, I think I have five dimensions in my latest <laughs> paper on this. And they can all be teased apart in, in certain situations. Yeah. But if you want to lump them all together, it's something like this. Goes. Okay, um, right. I don't know if I have to say more about this. Yeah, no, no, I'd say this too. So these show that the level of awareness of something or the level of intentionality of something is not constant. It can, it can move from being very aware to being less aware, or from being very not aware to becoming more aware. 
emotional perception, being aware of how you're reacting emotionally for many people starts here and then percolates up. You realize that you're angry. People might, you know, in the beginning they don't realize, and then it grows on them and they get more and more angry. And some, I am like that, for example. It goes a little slow. Sometimes I can get angry. So it depends on the situation. But the whole point of this model anyway is that both on a long-term and a short-term perspective, the levels are not constant. They can move up and down. So, challenge for SSP. How can a machine react to, recognize, and understand processes in multimodal communication? To what extent does the machine's processing have to be analogous to the processing in multimodal communication between living organisms? So that, that's the sort of traditional AI question in a sense. You know, um, when we create intelligent machines, do they have to be intelligent in the same sense as human beings? Do we have to do things the way human beings doing, or can we do it in a completely different way? Normally it turns out that if you mimic human beings, you actually learn a lot. So even if engineers will tell you, well, we've done, we've, we've made a clever thing here, it, it's not like human beings, but it's still clever. Then 10 years later they'll come back and say, we now looked at human beings and we saw that maybe we should get a little closer anyway. That, that's what I've seen in a way, dis discussing with people in artificial intelligence over the years. This is a fundamental difference with respect to a number of problems considered so far in, in uh, and it is related to a word that typically creates major uh, how can I say discussion in the interdisciplinary community which is ground two. Yeah. So the way it used to be this type of question, close or far from humans, it was in task where there was no doubt about. So when you recognize images of written digits let's say 99% of the time you know whether something is an 8 or a 6 and there is ambiguity there somewhere but someone you can somewhat know that that's an 8, that's a 9, that's a 0 and so on and so you have a, how can I say, a performance metric which is very much objective from that point of view yeah. in many of the problems we consider here like perception this morning is there anything right or wrong most we can do is to reproduce as closely as possible the assessment provided by a specific set of writers and if any human performs differently from that it's very hard to say whether it is better or worse so from this point of view this is a very peculiar uh, problem with respect to the rest of artificial intelligence or machine yeah, intelligence yeah. because it's hard to, to imagine even the metric that helps us to to, to, to compare humans and machine or even to compare humans but I suspect this discussion will be ongoing. Uh, yes. So yeah, far, yeah, 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 yeah. real organisms continue to be a fantastic source of inspiration for the engineers. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> <Software. laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So here is, uh, yeah, here is one of the challenges then for social signal processes. Uh, well, let's say that social signal processing, I think, has made the choice to be more interested in these two levels than in this level. So it's more interested in the non-conscious, maybe display is interesting, but what I'm calling signaling in the narrow sense, that is, I want you to recognize that that's not being on this social signal processing agenda. That is the typical thing for verbal communication. As soon as I use words, I actually want you to recognize that I'm showing you something. That's not the problem that is closest to the heart of social signal processing. Okay, so here is where we'll find the... So, and on the recipient side, we will have non-conscious processes and perception, not so much understanding and not so much signaling on the uh, other side. So those of you who want to do real understanding, dialogue systems, social signal processing is not the place for you. Social signal processing treats the outskirts of that, so to speak. So, yeah. Uh, non-conscious processing, was it non-conscious also in the one receiving, so to say? Yeah, there was a word here. Yeah. Recipient. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, okay, okay. Ah, yeah. oh, okay, because then I didn't. So here's the main communicator, me. and here's the recipient. This yeah, is okay. supposed to be a. So, so if the recipient is seeing the meaning in what is indicated, it's not. 
that level, even though the sender doesn't know. The if, if the recipient the sees the meaning and an indication, you are here or here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Those yeah. are parents, uh, No, 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 no. All the they are, it's uh, all the arrows go all ways, and I, if I make those, I have made those diagrams, but they become very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Some articles I have done. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, it's, um, sorry. Well, I'm yeah. On this side, uh, what, because when we talk about social signal processing, it's uh, like, for example, for third point of view analysis. Third point of view. Uh, like uh, you try to be, uh, for example, some machine which uh, manipulates the, uh, try to process this communication. Yeah. Piece too. And then uh, um, you actually, even you don't know if it's conscious or unconscious. If a machine, for example, cannot. Uh, no, uh, so you maybe have a hypothesis. Sometimes, if that's interesting, maybe you're not interested in that problem, but if you were interested in that, you would have to form some hypothesis about whether that was conscious or intentional or something like that. But, and maybe that's interesting in some cases. I mean, for example, if you want to judge if somebody is a criminal or not, are they consciously you know, hitting somebody or is it just accidental? <laughs> I, I don't know, but, but so, no, but th those are all hypotheses that the machine would have to form on the basis of the behavior. So there are a lot of, of uh, means of expression, communicative expressions, over and above the auditory aspects of speech. So Jürgen told you a lot about the auditory aspects, but here's a long list of non-auditory. Facial gestures, head movements, gaze direction, pupil size, lip and jaw movements, hand and arm movements, leg and foot movements, body posture, distance between communicators, spatial orientation, clothing and bracelets, touch, smell, taste, non-linguistic sounds, heart rate, blood pressure and skin conductance. Okay, and then we can probably get into other things. I mean, some of the most spectacular things that people are do, doing now have to do with the things which are, you know, really on probably low level of awareness and so on, like heart rate, skin conductance and so on. They are also involved in communicating. They're also part, I would at least say, of what social signal processing should be interested in. Uh, the studies are difficult to, to do, but some people are doing that, especially in the, in the context of medicine. Yeah. Where, where is the second uh, agent when there is a skin conductance measure? You and I are talking. Sir? I'm saying something uh, upsetting to you. And I have a machine measuring your skin conductance. It's going to change because I'm saying that to you. Okay. That's it. The heart rate changes in you. <laughs> the blood pressure might go up. These are things we don't see on the outside, but they are subconscious processes influencing you. Yeah? At the moment, I cannot perceive your change in skin conductance. Has this still something to do with communication? Sweating. Sweating. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an external sign of something that I have done that influences you. So you're showing me a sign in your body that you were influenced by me. That's it. So still the only physiological signals you consider are in the case of those that can be seen or perceived or sensed on the other side. I've already talked about awareness and, and intentionality. They do not necessarily always be perceived. But, but, these, but of course we are on the lookout if we have the kind of natural science uh, in the inclination. We are on the lookout for those things that can be measured. No, one thing is it can't be measured, and from a measurement point of view it's fine. But one thing, if I try to see coherence with respect to all these things so far, at the moment I cannot detect your uh, physiological changes. You cannot detect? Uh, de detect or feel or sense. But these are things, these are physiological, uh -huh. heart rate, blood pressure, etc. But can I see your heart rate? Or your blood pressure? No, but that, we, have the, we are open to the fact, or to the possibility, that we human beings don't know everything about the way we influence each other. We, this thing about contagion that we discussed this morning, we don't understand. There, there could be some mystical things still going on. We don't really know. But still, to include them in the discourse, you admit that there must be this possibility of 
sense and if we don't even realize it. There has to be some sort of sense, yeah, but we don't know anything about how the senses work. We don't, I mean, I don't know if your heart rate somehow influences me. I don't know. Old-fashioned view of this is that it, we think we know, because I cannot see your heart beating, but maybe it's another sense I, I'm sensing your heartbeat going past. <laughs> But imagine if, if no, imagine at a certain point we know that no. Well, it could be that way, yeah. But actually, I know a woman in Vienna who's done a lot of studies where she's shown that actually all these things are influenced in interaction. And, you know, they are they are systematically influenced, so it depends on what I do, then the other person would have that. That's, that's okay. I mean, it's, yeah. it's clear that if, if you insult me or if you attack me, it's clear that my, Yeah. But do you feel my heart? I don't know. Does my heartbeat influence you? All of the things on that list can be perceived by people under certain circumstances without any doubt. Every, every single one, including the heartbreak. And, and it's blood okay. Blood. My hear, question is... It increases in, in the vocal cords when you have a high blood pressure. Yeah, my question is, if they cannot, should yeah, they be in that list or not? No, that's my question. Right. If they cannot, <laughs> should they be in that list or not? That gets back to the question, if they do not influence the other person, they should not be on this list. But they could influence the other person without the other person being aware of it. So then this depends on your notion of communication. If you have a narrow notion of communication, you exclude the things which you are not aware of, you should not have it on this list. If you, like me, have a broad notion, it should stay there. Yeah, there is even another way to influence when you have the device, you make, actually, way to influence the other person, so maybe again should be in the list. Could be, no. Yes, yes, I mean it's clear that maybe we will evolve with our mach our machines and we'll have new ways, so that's possible, sure, yeah. Why are you laughing? That's right. That's right. <laughs> we, should, we should equip everyone with blood pressure meters so we know when we go too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> We don't know everything yet, that's why we're in this, it's an exciting field. <laughs> but anyway, like uh, heart rate influence the, I don't know, your sweating, so influence your smell. Yes. So everything is, uh, is a cause of yes. another thing, so yes. the same for bloody pressure or skin, skin conduction, I yeah. don't know. But so they're all... Yeah, are all cause yeah. of other things. Causal chains which are, yeah. which are long sometimes, I agree. Yeah. You should feel happy, Alessandro, that we have no, no work to do. I'm very happy. <laughs> My question was exactly so. Uh, when you tell me we should keep open the door and think that maybe we, yeah. we actually perceive, still it seems to me that what you mean is by keeping the door open, you still post the condition that in any case, whatever phenomenon happening in people that cannot be perceived by the other, should not be. Uh, do I, I don't correct? agree. No, I don't no. agree because you are all the time saying perceive. Or sensed or. Uh, okay, and you include in that non aware influence. Okay. Okay, if you include that, yes, then I say yes, I agree with you. Okay. There has to be an influence of some sort. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about influence, some yeah. kind of. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, 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 I agree there. No. Okay. So it's, it's, okay. it's why I said that, you know, if this person is alone in the bed and you have a camera and so on, that's not so social mm -hmm. process. So I, it's not that I want everything in here. Uh, excuse me. Uh, something that is not present uh, in the present moment. But yeah. For example, I know your background and yeah. that is affecting me between in the communication I'm doing with you. Yes. Is that social signal processing? And you're not showing it right now, but... I happen to know something. But I haven't talked yes, about yeah. all the factors yeah. that will influence your interpretation here. I mean, there are lots of factors that will influence your interpretation. We heard about personality this morning, but I, I haven't really talked about that yet. I, you, I, I don't want to take a stand on that right now. But I think it could be, that kind, could be the kind of thing that could influence your interpretation. Okay, so, uh, yeah, we have already talked about this, I think, that the focus in social signal processing will be on index and icon and not so much on symbol. No, it's not, words out. <laughs> the rest.
icon and index. And perhaps especially on index. I don't know how much you've done on icons actually in social signal processing. That's where you use similarity. But in, I, basically, I think it should be there. But the, fo the focus in social signal processes is, is on index, and it's definitely not on symbols. <coughs> yeah? But I think there's a problem there that I feel when I read things in social signal processing, for instance, that you use uh, another language or you, you block so people don't understand only the prosody and so on. Uh, you can do that, but, but then if you want to apply this to real life situations, people always, you always have the content of what people are saying, and that's very important. And uh, by, by filtering it out, you're creating a kind of in artificial uh, situation in a way, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting in itself, but how you put them together then, in the end. Yeah. Well, not for machines. Eh? We should always remember that we take all of this and we squeeze it to a machine. When we do this experiment, for example, in seeing whether you can do that without the words, mm -hmm. it's not just as an experiment, it's because for the machines it's much easier to be, to extract from a signal speech and the type yeah. of stuff than to transcribe it. For yeah, example, there is often a uh, bear with technological motivation there. Mm -hmm. So one of the attractiveness in the end for nonverbal communication in the end is that can be sometimes much easier to detect and deal with than how it is uh, recognized, really transcribed, for example, what people say. Mm -hmm. This is a question that often people pose to me after a presentation, why don't you use what people say? Well, in part because it is much more difficult to get sometimes, in part because it becomes language dependent, mm -hmm. we have a lot of speech recognition for English, but change language it becomes extremely complicated. In times because, you know, in this big brotherish society we are having, still, for example, what people say is still relatively protected by privacy issues and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I can understand so. that it, 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 I understand all these points. Mm -hmm. It's just that I think of practically, I mean, applications yes, yes. and so on, that if the person would listen to this, and then we get, uh, what's that, what they're actually saying, well then, cancel what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could get that kind of situations too. Yeah, but, yeah. Okay. But okay, but it's okay in the development of science to parcel yeah. things up a bit and some people concentrate on some parts and social signal processing from my point of view, because I'm interested in communication in general, including content and understanding and so on, but I, I think it's been under-researched compared to the other part. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's, I think, okay to devote some special energy to getting uh, more information on these parts. Yeah. Yeah. But we've had a lot of discussion all the time, so... <laughs> uh, so the contents of multimodal communication. SSP in principle should recognize all multimodal contents since they occur as contents to be share shared socially. This is Elizabeth's question, basically, right? In principle, that word is... Okay. So let's look at the contents of communication. Here's an attempt at the taxonomy. Physiological states. Fatigue, hunger should be recognized. Well, if they influence some, somebody else, then they could be relevant. Character, identity, personality, stance. Well, we heard a talk this morning where Alessandro was arguing that that could be part of it. Haughty, timid, aggressive, etc. Effective epistemic attitudes, and we're using this term because we don't think it's so easy to draw the line between emotions and attitudes. So uh, that would be uh, joy, friendliness, surprise, boredom. Yes, we want to recognize those. Factual content, giving information about our beliefs and assumptions concerning facts. No, that's not the main interest of it, social signal processing. That is the main interest perhaps often in, when you have more verbal systems. Communication management. That is information about interactive communication management, <coughs> feedback, turn-taking sequences, etc. And all communication management, like hesitation, choice, changing what you're saying. That probably should be part of what we're doing in SSP. I'm not sure. I haven't really got a clear view on that from people in SSP yet. It's definitely something you're interested in if you're doing conversation and dialogue. Uh, Okay, so 
I have written here as a conclusion, SSP should be able to handle all types of content, but has less of a focus on factual content. That's, I don't think I have time to do this. I was just going to tell you that small talk is important. And if SSP has any claim to fame in the realm of the social, it should have something to say about or do in small talk. I think I'll skip that right now. Uh, I think maybe this might take too long also. This is part of the theory that we, where we have two people or more communicating and their contributions to the conversation has different orientations. There is a responsive orientation, reaction to what has been said. There is an expressive, expressing some emotion or attitude. There is an evocative, trying to call forth a reaction from the other person. And there is a referential, trying to talk about something in the world. If we were really going to do semantics and pragmatics in SSP, we would have to do something about all of these. And what I have following this is example, but I won't do that now, I think. And interaction, well, I don't know how if all of these are in the focus of SSP, but if interaction management is part of it, then I think feedback, turn-taking, sequencing, rhythm, other aspects of the synchronicity of behavior. So there we get back to the heart rate, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. So I think those, those are all part. And then we can notice that people who are in social signal processing have been also interested in various interaction modes. So here are some fairly basic interaction modes. Conflict, competition, cooperation, collaboration. All of those have been under some investigation. But, it but it's the aspects of these which are indicated, displayed, indexical, iconic. It's not the symbolic, not the really understood, not the verbal aspects of this. Okay. Conclusions. So I have been trying to give a definition of social signal processing and done some semantic role analysis of what it is. And then I have tried to give an analysis of the relationship between social signal processing and multimodal communication. And I have uh, given a description of some of the challenges facing social signal processing if, if you have your point of view coming from multimodal communication, I would say. Thank you. So, we have time for some. Yeah, five minutes for questions. Yeah. On your last slide, um, I'm quite sure that communication management and social signal. Yeah. Uh, if you can come back just one slide. Just. Yeah. So the feedback, turn taking, sequences, and rhythm is often used as uh, features. And yeah. we do automatic recognition. So, as always, if you have two persons interacting, we look at the uh, percentage of time people spoke, uh, if they should interrupt each other, or if they overlap speech. But we use this number as input to the machine learning to infer if there's conflict, competition, cooperation, collaboration. Yes. So I would do it the same way. Yes, but the thing is, this is using as a speed, but um, <coughs> it's more as a features, as a sort of input. Something we can observe, we don't want to credit it, we just observe it. Measure it. I don't come from SSP, I come from linguistics and communication oh, yes. studies, okay? Yeah. So what we see is that these are featured, I have nothing against the word feature, it's fine. It's features of the interactive behavior. I yes. say the same as you, I think. Yeah, okay. Do you see a, you see a contradiction there? Or? No, it's not a contradiction, I just <laughs> this is um, already used uh, in our approach. The yeah. same way we use speech or the formats. No, I, I, I agree. I, I have seen papers that, that uh, address most of these issues. So I think it's there, yeah. Yeah. Any other? Yeah? It's me. I have a comment on the term signals. Yes. Um, I think I disagree with you on signals here. And uh, for I used me, it in two different ways. Okay. Which, which way did you disagree with? 
Um, let's see. Um, let's put my definition first, and then you can see where we yeah. disagree. Yeah. I know signals as a term where we can see the physical appearance of audio signals, video signals, bio signals, or whatever, yeah. which you can measure on one level and signs on the other. And on the sign level, you can have the indexical sign, an iconical sign, or a symbolic sign. Yeah. And you have uh, seen the, the symbolic sign as a signal. So I was confused a little bit. And I'm sure that people you, you in statistical processing would also see signals more on a measurable uh, level. You, um, I, I'm not sure I understand what you're saying, actually. But okay. in linguistics, there is expression and content. Yeah. Okay. It sounded like you were just giving another word for expression rather than content. Right, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, you can In that case, it. of course, symbols also have, si have a signal inside. Symbols, word like chair. Ch -ch -ch -ch. That's the expression side. Chair. Yeah, but you're talking... This is the content side. Okay, then, uh, no, then uh, in this case, uh, the expression side has a, a signal side where, where you can measure something yeah. and a more conceptual side. Yeah, well, that's the same as I said. Mm, yes, there's no. just, there are many different theories of semantics. This is okay. a referential, you know, but you want a more cognitive theory, perhaps. No, I only want to make a difference between the physics, mm -hmm. in this case the acoustics, yes. where you can measure, right. no, I and a phonemic structure, for example, for the morpheme okay, okay, but, chair. But, but I think we, I, you're using the word signal, I think, in the same way as Alessandro is using it. That's the broad sense of the expressions, not the content, really. It's the expressions. Yeah. Okay. I was not, I was, that was one of the ways I was using the word signal too. When I was using it in social signal processing, I was using it in that way. Okay. Okay. Then, a long time ago, I defined another notion of signal which is a lot more narrow, which has to do with this intentionalistic approach to communication, where you have indicate, display, and signal. That choice of the word signal, which I made in 1976, um, was a bit unfortunate, but, <laughs> but I, I have not found a better word for it yet, so I haven't changed it. But I always am careful to point out that this isn't the, you know, the broad word sig signal that you're using or that Alessandro is using. It's a more narrow notion. Yeah. And could you also use the word sign for that? No, not no. at all. Okay. Because uh, that's, not, that's, a, that's the Persian, you know, index, icon, symbol. Those are signs. This indicate display and signal or levels of intentionality with which you're using the signs. The diff these are not the same thing. They are two different things. One is communicative intentionality. The other one is what kind of relation exists between the signifier and the signifier. I think there is a, there is a source of confusion that in, in technical fields the entire acoustic signal, the entire screen of the acoustics inside the cable is called the signal. But the video signal is called the signal. Yeah. It's the, it's no, the I think that's the unprocessed entirety. That, that sense so, of signal is compatible with Alessandro and yeah, Jürgen. Yeah, no, it's, it's just a third sense from what we're talking about. I'm not it's sure. A, I don't think it's a third. I think it's the same sense as they are using. But it's a third sense from what you are talking about. It's a different sense from my narrow sense of signal, absolutely. But I don't think it's a different sense from what you have in social no, signal no. processing. Because the word social actually makes it more narrow. Yeah. Yeah, Christina. Um, I would sort of go back to a little bit different uh, thing, and uh, it's uh, related to turn taking and yeah. uh, and cooperation and, and things like yeah. like that. Right. And uh, also um, about the things about agent and uh, recipient. So if I understand. Um, Correctly, you you were trying to, for instance, in turn taking, you were trying to, to say that it's uh, it's more like a, a process where both the uh, agent and recipient are kind of creating uh, that um, sort of sharing what, we, what we yeah sharing what we yeah. we can call turn taking. Yeah. But but one thing is that. Um, 
uh, if you think of the agents as a sort of a autonomous, uh, intentional, aware of their the, um, kind of behavior, they are independent persons or independent agents. Yeah. And then they are interacting with the other agents and they need to have some kind of a coordination. So basically this kind of um, sharing is a result of some behavior that uh, takes place when both of the agents or several of the agents um, so sort of individually make certain decisions how they behave and react to a certain certain situation. Is that are you still sort of following? And then what what I wanted to ask is how how do you see this this sort of what you call interaction modes or cooperation? That's one of your basic important uh, well, concepts. If you remember in my yeah. Account okay. of cooperation, I have several levels of cooperation. Yeah. Okay, so the lowest level is called coordination. Okay. Yeah. And then you have collaboration, and then you have cooperation. So, on the lowest level, exactly what you described, we have coordination, which sometimes can be subconscious, etc. Okay. That, that's a. Uh, and then when we add intention to go for a joint goal, goal, we get to collaboration. And then when we add ethical considerations, etc., we get uh, cooperation. But when you, sorry, when you take turns, so that yeah. is a cooperation, or it's... I think it's, I think it's a collaboration. Okay. It's coordination plus a joint goal of sharing understanding. Usually, or sh sharing some joint goal anyway. That that's why you take turns because you want to you want to get to a joint goal. And and in communication, it's shared. That's a shared understanding. So that I would I would think of that as a type of uh, collaboration. Yeah. But collaboration is an intermediate stage then between coordination and cooperation. Okay. Oh. That, that's yeah. We should stop and have some refreshments. The workshop seems to start at the same time. Yeah, it's a, maybe we need to have a little coffee and, and drink, and then we start the, the workshops uh, maybe in 10 minutes or so. Yeah. We, we have to divide the groups and start from here. Yeah, we start here. Yeah.